Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jude Blanchett, and I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. I'm delighted to be moderating this very important discussion today on how the Russian invasion of Ukraine is reverberating through Asia, both in the near term, but also looking longer term. I think as most of us watch the horror and destruction that has been unleashed by Vladimir Putin, we're also seeing great heroism and courage by the Ukrainian people and strong condemnation and actions from nations around the world. And this of course includes Asia, but where events of the past several weeks are being watched with great concern. And it's clear, we're going to see some very important long-term repercussions, uh, both from uh, the actions of Vladimir Putin, but also from other important dynamics which have occurred. Importantly, the increasing um, alignment between Moscow and Beijing. There's a lot to unpack here, uh, ranging from how allies and partners are responding to Beijing's calculations and how they might be shifting vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, thinking about foreign policy in India. This is really momentous times, and I'm delighted to be joined by three of my colleagues, all of whom bring just extraordinary expertise to the discussion today. They are in alphabetical order, uh, Charlie Dell, who holds the Australia chair here at CSIS, Bonnie Lin, the director of the China Power Project, and Rick Rosso, who's the Wadwani chair in US-India policy studies. We've got a lot to get through, so I wanna get right into it. Before we start, just a very brief logistics note. I'm going to be moderating a discussion for probably 40 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll, keep the remaining 15 minutes, um, if possible, for Q&A. I would invite everyone who's watching, if you have a question, you, you can uh, ask that at any time. Please go to CSIS.org, click the events page, and look for the specific events page for, for our discussion. Today, you'll see a button marked Ask Live Question. Please send that through. Those are being sent to me in real time. And as we um, approach the Q&A period, uh, I will start uh, posing these uh, to my colleagues. So with that, let's get right into it. I wanna direct the first question to Bonnie. You had a recent commentary uh, up on CSIS where you wrote that if Xi Jinping did indeed have advance warning of the Russian invasion, and let me quote here, China's decision to deepen relations with Russia showcases Beijing's willingness to take substantial risk and that Xi Jinping uh, likely has a pessimistic view of China's relations with the West. Xi could also have a larger appetite for military adventurism, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, you caveat that by saying, we don't know what, uh, what Xi Jinping knew when he knew it. We don't know what was uh, spoken during that February 4th meeting versus Xi and Putin. Uh, but nonetheless, I wonder if you could unpack that statement. How do you see events in Ukraine impacting Beijing's own thinking about the use of force uh, in the Indo-Pacific? And I think specifically, most of us are watching Taiwan very carefully. Thank you very much, Jude. It's really great to join you as well as uh, Rick and Charlie on this panel. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the sentence you just quoted, so my personal thinking is that there seems to be more and more evidence suggesting that she may have not known. So. Uh, for example, how slow China has been to evacuate its citizens and the switching guidance that China has provided for, for its citizens. First saying, please show the Chinese flag, and then saying, please don't show the Chinese flag. And now how some of Chinese, China's citizens have been targeted. I think there are at least reports of at least one Chinese citizen being killed uh, in Ukraine. So when I look at what's happening in Ukraine, my main concern is that the increasing linkages between Ukraine and Taiwan is increasing the perception that Taiwan will be next. And there, of course, are a number of reasons why this is a good parallel, but I want to actually spend the bulk of my time discussing why there are potential lessons learned China could take from Ukraine that would actually discourage China from taking a significant adventure against Taiwan, 
and also some of the factors that may constrain China from using force against Taiwan in the near future. So let me quickly point out what folks have been saying are the parallels. And this includes uh, the fact that both Taiwan and Ukraine face uh, more powerful and aggressive neighbors, as you mentioned due to the growing China-Russia ties, but also concerns that the Russian invasion in Ukraine could encourage China to do the same against Taiwan, or at least increase aggression against Taiwan. The main, some of the main reasons that folks cite as why this could happen in the near term are that uh, China may see the United States and Europe preoccupied in Ukraine, and that could provide space for China to escalate against Taiwan. I think theoretically that is possible, but that is not at least what we're seeing now. There's very little indication that dynamics that as dynamics in Ukraine are escalating, that the United States or the West is decreasing its attention in Thailand. In fact, our colleague Mike Green is currently a part of the former senior defense delegation in Taiwan right now. That only shows how much the United States, as well as international community, is focusing on Taiwan. And the growing linkages that are being talked about with Ukraine and Taiwan means that there is now even greater scrutiny on PLA operations against Taiwan than any other time. I, I do want to focus on um, some of the potential lessons learned China could take from Ukraine. And I know it's still very early to assess these lessons learned, but I think there are three lessons learned that could actually give China more pause when thinking about any major use of military force, uh, particularly uh, with respect to Taiwan. The first is looking at assessments of international unity and support for what's happening in Ukraine. So right now we're seeing growing NATO international unity and support against Russia's invasion of Ukraine. China's CCTV and main news outlets have been reporting, for example, the major shift in Germany's position on Ukraine, including reversing previous limits to providing arms to Ukraine, as well as now uh, Germany's change in agreeing to exclude Russia, Russian banks from SWIFT. So this occurs despite Germany's high reliance on Russian energy. Chinese commentators have further noted that this support, uh, both broadly across Europe, but also uh, with respect to Germany, is likely to come at quite some cost for European countries as well as the United States. So when you put this in the context of how China looks at its periphery, one of the main arguments that Chinese analysts have made is as China's military and political, sorry, economic and political power has grown, um, Chinese analysts believe that China, Growing economic reliance on China should constrain the options of other countries to side with the United States or side against China. But what we're seeing in Ukraine is the opposite, right? We're not seeing that European reliance on Russian energy is causing Europe to stay on the sidelines. In fact, what we're seeing is that um, Europe is becoming more unified. This should at least introduce some uncertainty when China thinks about how countries position themselves during peacetime versus how countries positions may change in a crisis or a conflict. The second uh, point, uh, potential lesson learned I want to point out is related to the role of intelligence and information in shaping uh, conflicts. So what's been quite unique in this conflict has been how much the United States has used intelligence to shape the environment, even prior to the outbreak of conflict. We've seen an unprecedented rate of declassification of uh, U.S. intelligence to share that early on with not only US allies and partners, but in, in this case, also China, regarding Russian intentions, but also military activities targeted at Ukraine. In many ways, this fast sharing of intelligence has allowed the United States to build a coalition to oppose Russian aggression even before it began. It allowed us to provide um, arms as well as support to the Ukrainian forces. So if you contrast this with Chinese assessments of Ukraine. We don't know for sure how Beijing assessed this, but we do seem to see from the public messaging that Beijing didn't believe that Russia was going to go into Ukraine. And even after on the eve of um, Russia's beginning of its special military operation in Ukraine, there were still many in Beijing saying that Russia would not go into Kyiv. right? So it seems like at least publicly, many Chinese assessments were wrong. So when China looks at this or should, when China looks at this, it should at least um, question, you know, how good is U.S. intelligence? And when it comes to its periphery, China should at least question, to what extent does U.S. intelligence have, uh, to what extent is does U.S. intelligence also have this level of fidelity with respect to Chinese military intentions and capabilities? And if China were to engage in, in a similar large-scale operation, could China successfully hide its preparations for it? Or is what is, is playing out in Ukraine showing that China may not be able to hide it anywhere as close to what it thinks it could do? 
a third potential lesson learned is um, the difficulties of a rapid invasion of any other region or territory. So in many ways, the Russian land invasion of Ukraine is a much simpler military uh, goal, a task than a Chinese amphibious invasion of Taiwan, which is separated from mainland China from the, with the Taiwan Strait, which is 100 mile uh, body of water. The, Ch the Russian military also has significantly more experience, uh, at least recently, in conflicts than the PLA. So what we we're seeing in Ukraine is that uh, there's a early flow, snake flow of arms to Ukraine from uh, NATO and Europe, as well as the United States. And during the conflict, there was significant resistance from Ukraine against the Russian force. At the same time, we're also seeing that right now, as now, Russian troops are facing logistical challenges. There are shortages of food and fuel, and some Russian troops are already losing morale. It hasn't even been that long since the beginning of the Russian invasion. We're seeing that the Russian attempt to execute a rapid invasion and to minimize civilian casualties is much harder than what Moscow envisioned. Even if Russia takes Kyiv, there's there remains a possibility that Ukrainian forces could form an insurgent force to challenge Moscow's hold and influence longer term. So when you look at this from China's perspective and put it in the context of Taiwan, given that Taiwan will be a more difficult problem set, uh, sorry, a Taiwan invasion will be much more difficult and that China, the PLA has much less recent military experience than Russia, this should actually give China a significant pause as well as significant re-questioning of its military plans for Taiwan. I know I'm running a little bit over, but let me also quickly point out three other constraining factors on um, how China might think about use of potential military force, large scale force in the near term. The first factor has been discussed quite a bit in the media, and that's the uh, upcoming 20th Party Congress and how Xi Jinping likely does not want to take major risks prior to that. And any major conflict or major military uh, operation will incur significant risks. So I'm not going to uh, elaborate on that. The second factor, which I think has not been discussed as much, regard relates to China's growing relationship with Russia and what we're seeing now, which is China trying to distance itself from the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So despite the fact that China still wants to um, maintain and in some ways uh, deepen its ties with Russia, China does not want to be associated with the Russian aggression in Ukraine and has taken great pains to try to create some distance, particularly on the military side. But if China was to engage in a major military operation uh, anywhere more than Indo-Pacific, it will be perceived by the international community as China creating a second front war to help Russia, regardless what causes China to use military force. So I think in that respect, there will, China will be somewhat cautious in trying to at least start a conflict or a major, use, use major military force while the Ukraine crisis is ongoing. The, uh, the third major constraining factor is that we're seeing the rise uh, in prices of key commodities, such as oil, gas, and food. Uh, they're soaring now, and China has been for some time trying to build up more of a reserve on these commodities to sustain its economic growth, but also to maintain social stability. These same commodities are what are needed to uh, fuel a war, right? So if you think about a conflict or major military operation now, China would then be div uh, diverting these key resources that are, that are critical to its domestic population and economy to a wartime effort. Uh, right now, that doesn't seem to be the best uh, situation for China to do that now, but maybe as if China can wait the Ukraine conflict out, it's possible that Chinese analysts could assess that it would be in a better position later on to engage in more military operations. So I know I've run over, so let me wrap up here. Thank you, Jude. Great. Thanks, Bunny. Those are really, um, really excellent comments. And and as you were speaking, I was thinking another another. Um, Un known unknown for Beijing would be the role of leadership. And I think here about the remarkable performance of President Zelensky and his courage. It's very it's very arguable that um, statements by Zelensky, the sort of the courage and heroism he has shown, arguably tip the balance in terms of EU sanctions just over the matter of a couple days. Um, and the second, you know, the second to me lesson here is I think Beijing you know, there's an argument that, that Beijing thought this would be a good case study to explore how the West doesn't work um, and how divided it is. But actually, I think what we're seeing is now the reverse is going to be happening, where this is a this is now a case study for the West in how a unified, strong response um, is possible. And so, I think this is really going to, in the long term, blow up in Beijing's uh, blow up in Beijing's face. Um, 
So, uh, but again, a lot of this remains to be seen and will depend on how things play out over, as you say, over the next sort of hours, days, weeks, weeks and months. Um, Rick, let me turn to you if I can. And if I can um, also quote from a recent commentary uh, that, that you penned, which I thought was really excellent in thinking about the role of India here. You wrote, quote, India has managed to maintain close relations with Russia while dramatically improving strategic ties with the United States. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has made this position hard to maintain. I wonder if you could likewise unpack that statement and give us a sense of what the discussion in New Delhi is right now. Um, you know, they're abstaining from, or they have abstained from the votes at the UN Security Council. So on the surface, it would seem like the, the, the non-aligned position of India is, is holding firm. Um, but how do you see this playing out in the days, weeks, and months ahead? Well, non-alignment certainly still remains the name of the game in Delhi, with the exception of most anything we put on the table vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, India avoiding taking a hard line on Russia, you know, it's not uh, not terribly surprising. I think, you know, when you see a lot of the pressure that the world's been trying to mount on India, you know, for instance, calls for supporting democracy, uh, India is very proud of its own democracy, but also has always uh, assiduously avoided, you know, trying to become the sort of democracy in, in, in trying to oppress it on others, uh, with the exception of when it fits in, you know, narrow uh, self-interest, you know, for instance, uh, recent elections in, in Maldives and uh, Sri Lanka, when it looks like you know, uh, pro-China governments would remain in office. Uh, India supported uh, opposition parties in those uh, nations to make sure that democratic elections were held and brought forward parties that were that were certainly more pro-India, more pro-West, although Sri Lanka has had another election since then that went the other way. Um, so supporting democracy when, when it suits it, but not as an ultimatum for every country around the world at all times. India's position on the Ukraine invasion uh, has also uh, evolved incrementally uh, even in the days since the invasion began, you know, originally calling for uh, a ceasefire. Now, 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 you know, the language a little more forward leaning and talking about um, uh, making sure that uh, uh, territorial territorial integrity is maintained. And you may see it evolve further, um, but it's not an easy choice for the reasons that I'll I'll kind of lay out here. And, and all this about India's uh, disinterest in taking a hard line, uh, of course, is all the more visible as you rightly point out. Uh, sitting at having one of the rotating seats on the UN Security Council. Uh, you, you can't sort of hide behind others' actions. Uh, it's become very visible. And by some of you know what I read and some of the things I'm getting in my Twitter uh, feed, you, you almost would expect that Indian troops were actually joining Russian troops in the invasion or something, which of course is, is pretty far from the truth. But uh, why is this a hard choice uh, for India? Um, you know, it, it, it'll directly uh, impact India's own national security in a couple of important ways. But first, you know, let me talk about what you're going to hear. You'll hear about India talking about its long historical ties with Russia. Um, at a long time during the Cold War, when the United States had very little relationship with India to speak of, uh, the Soviet Union, you know, was really the uh, the main provider uh, of of a lot of uh, assistance, not just defense technology, but engineering colleges, things like that, importing a lot of Indian goods, including movies. At times that um, you know the uh, uh, the rupee wasn't convertible with the rest of the world. So, um, so the Soviet Union, you know, really was uh, an important friend to, the, to to India for a long time. But historical ties, look, as 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 global situations change, um, those are relatively easy to snap if they don't have modern importance. The second thing that you'll hear in India, which is the rhetoric that certainly Russia has been trying to promote, and you do hear it echoed uh, in, in Delhi, is um, uh, Ukraine's dalliance with NATO and, and NATO's press. You know, a lot of that rhetoric that we basically caused this for ourselves by trying to press a lot of Eastern European countries. Um, to uh, to shift west and uh, and so you know we know that these countries wanted to go west because they're worried about things like invasion. So um, you know those are the two things that you hear: historical ties and and Ukraine's uh, dalliance with with the West and with NATO. But there's a lot more concrete reasons, two two in particular, where India has to balance you know the promotion of democracy in other countries versus its own national security. This historical ties with the Soviet Union meant that today, Rus India's military. Uh, is comprised heavily of Russian equipment, and uh, and they rely on Russian spares, not just new acquisitions, but Russian spares. A number I saw recently, about $2 billion a year, is what India spends simply in spares for the military equipment that India has uh, right now. India has actually lost territory to China in the last couple of years, and also attempted to defend Bhutan's territory by major territorial grabs by China. And India's ability to, to maintain you know, a, a defensive posture and military readiness today is unfortunately 
very reliant on, on Russian equipment and Russia imports of, of spares to keep things uh, moving and operational. So India's own national security today, at a time that you actually have had soldiers dying in the line of combat with China, um, mostly rocks and sticks and bad weather and things like that, but they're at the front lines, uh, is unfortunately heavily reliant on Russian equipment. And that is hard for Indian policymakers to uh, to ignore for obvious reasons. Second, you know, think of the uh, the moment that the invasion was launched and who was sitting uh, with uh, President Putin in Russia. Uh, it was the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan. And the other thing that India uh, really is concerned about, would Russia potentially open up the kitty on sharing advanced defense technology to India's major rival, Pakistan, with which they fought three wars? Um, that is a real threat to India. And if India feels that maintaining a decent relationship with Moscow gives them a bit of say in potentially being able to slow or block potential export of technologies to the country with which India you know, continues to have every couple of years uh, real military flare-ups, uh, Pakistan has no hope of ever gaining a numerical advantage, but you know Russia could help them gain a technological advantage in terms of a military confrontation. So you know both uh, both China and and uh, Pakistan are two incredibly important considerations for India. And uh, you know again, unfortunately, and I, I think India would certainly prefer that they made different options earlier and have different choices right now. But their ability to maintain um, you know military posture versus these two. Uh, you know, relies uh, very heavily on Russia. Now, that being said, uh, you can make a good case as to why India has so far maintained a position that is uh, certainly less hard than we'd like. But India may face real re repercussions for this. Uh, one thing in particular is really kind of burning down the highway to towards us right now. Uh, the potential application of U.S. sanctions against India for buying Russian military equipment, in this instance, particularly the S-400 Triumph missile defense system, uh, news reports indicate that India has already received a first of the missile defense kits and that uh, Ministry of Defense officials have told media that uh, it could be April by the time that they're, uh, they're first set up. Uh, and as we saw with Turkey, you know, once they become operational or being tested, that may be the point at which uh, sanctions under the Countering American Adversaries Through Sanctions Act would have to be introduced. There is a narrow waiver provision. And, um, you know, I think by and large, when you see U.S.-India relations and minister meetings and head of state meetings, you know, kind of showed there was some intent not to blow up the relationship through the application of sanctions. But, you know, now with this additional complexity of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the fact that sanctions are being compounded, not relaxed, uh, giving out waivers, uh, it just seems a little bit more difficult than it would have been, you know, just a couple of months ago. So we do have a, a very, very specific threat um, that I think uh, kind of sits on the horizon. So uh, India has uh, self-interested reasons, protection of its own national security against its two great rivals. Uh, as to why I want to maintain a decent relationship, but there's uh, one major threat, which is the application of U.S. sanctions, which could really derail what has been, as you point out in the opening, a, a promising uh, change in trajectory in U.S. India relations. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Jude. Great, wonderful. Th thanks, thanks, Rick. Really great remarks. And I, I want to once, um, once we get to the back of the conversation, I want to circle back around and and ask you about how over the longer term trajectory, a potential deepening of relations between Moscow and Beijing. Um, might might affect New Delhi's calculations over the long term, but but let me now turn it over to Charlie. Um, I wanted to ask how the how events are reverberating through allies in the Indo Pacific. So can you give us a an, an overview, um, making an arc from Tokyo all the way to Canberra, and, and let us know. Um, you know, first, I guess, first question is just what are the immediate responses and what are some of the immediate discussions that, that you're hearing about? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jude. And uh, thanks for pulling together uh, what has been a really terrific conversation so far. I've learned a lot from uh, both Bonnie and Rick here. Um, look, there have been major geopolitical implications to Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, and we're seeing drastic shifts in multiple countries' national security. Um, this is obviously more profound in Europe than it is in Asia to date, but it's important to note that there's significant movement there as well. Uh, but look, I, I know you'd like me to kind of arc from uh, Tokyo down to Canberra and hit everything in between, but actually I'd like to start in Europe, just a really quick overview because everyone in the region is watching what is happening there as Bonnie was talking about. And look what's happened just over the last couple of days, right? Germany, a revolution in their national security thinking, defense, budget over 2% 2 per, uh, 2 of their GDP, pledging more than $100 billion euros. Uh, Finland and Sweden moving towards NATO quickly. Uh, the Ukraine has applied to join the EU. 
Switzerland, of all uh, nations, has frozen the assets of uh, Russia. Russia is being disconnected financially, diplomatically, and politically from the international system as the EU gets stronger by the moment. Uh, and I think that's the context in which every nation is assessing its own moves. When we shift our view out to the Indo-Pacific, it's a much more varied picture. Uh, we've seen really uh, lukewarm statements uh, by ASEAN. Uh, we heard Rick's comments about the bind, the strategic dilemma that India finds itself in. But when we begin to shift uh, the focus to formal allies of the United States, we can see more active measures being taken in almost ascending order from South Korea to Japan to Australia. So I thought I might sketch some of what we're seeing in each of those countries, um, uh, at least before turning the conversation to uh, where uh, the conversation should probably be moving to. So look, in South Korea, uh, South Korea was initially cautious about joining any international sanctions in the days leading up to the invasion, uh, saying that they were leaving various options open um, and would only join international sanctions uh, if and when Russia launched the invasion. Uh, they also said that the country wasn't considering military support or sending any troops or equipment. Uh, and as if to underscore that the Blue House, the presidential office in South Korea, said that Russia has been an important partner to South Korea on its North Korean policy. Uh, but look, that was before and this is now. And after the invasion, Seoul drew a line. It tightened its export controls against Russia. It banned uh, shipments of strategic items and it joined Western countries in moves to block Russian banks uh, from SWIFT international payment systems. A at the same time, though, uh, Russia, uh, sorry, South Korea has sought certain exemptions from the sanctions, uh, particularly ones that would affect its large exporters like Samsung. And I would note that all of this comes in the middle of a heated presidential election that is set to take place in one week's time in Seoul. Uh, in Japan, the reaction has been more robust. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida said, uh, Japan needs to show its resolve not to allow any changes to the status quo by force. Territorial integrity is really important. He's obviously talking about Russia, but he also very obviously has other countries in mind when he says this. And he joined together with the EU and the G7 countries to impose sanctions, including on chip exports, on some but not all Russian banks, on Russian military-led um, organizations, um, and on general purpose products to Russia. Now, Kashida told reporters that Japan would also uh, move to sanction uh, Belarus uh, after they have green-lighted the potential move of nuclear weapons onto their territory. The context for this is that defense spending is just over 1% in Japan. Uh, Kishida's party has called for an increase to 2%, which is a radical uh, turn in Japanese politics. But the assumption had been that Kishida wouldn't be too forward leaning on defense until after the upper house elections in July. Uh, and I would note that Ukraine has certainly injected much more urgency into the debate. And you look no further then former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who appeared on Japanese television this past weekend and said that Japan should undertake or at least consider a nuclear sharing agreement with the U.S. similar to NATO. Uh, that's a revolution. Uh, I would also note that the prime minister, the actual prime minister, dismissed this idea. Um, look, shifting to Australia, uh, first, uh, the Australian uh, prime minister uh, has continued to make very forthright comments. Uh, President Putin, he said, Foreign Minister Lavrov, the Defense Minister, are directly responsible for Russia's unprovoked and unlawful invasion of Ukraine. He's also continued to take on China very directly. Uh, what he said was, you don't go and throw a lifeline to Russia in the middle of a period when they're invading another country. This is simply unacceptable. And this was a reference uh, to the recently signed Russian-Chinese agreement that Bonnie and you had uh, talked about, but also as part of a broader compact to strengthen their relations, China uh, quietly agreed to lift restrictions on Russian wheat and barley right before this happened. Uh, I would note that this is not something that's owned just by the government. The opposition party, Labour, and note there is an election in Australia coming up quite soon, has made a similar set of robust comments. Uh, Australia went ahead and joined Western initiatives, including sanctioning Russian, Russian central banks, uh, restricting golden passports, moving to kick them out of SWIFT, and things are moving quickly. So on Monday night, 
Uh, we know that Australia just announced that it would provide 70 million Australian dollars in lethal military aid to support the defense of Ukraine, which includes uh, missiles uh, and other weapons as well. So that's kind of the roundup around the allies, but says nothing yet about where we might be headed. Charlie, can I um, just quickly follow up on that? Um, one of the things it seems we're doing is we've we've both realized how linear projections are unhelpful given the role of contingency, right? So we've just seen this pretty remarkable shift, you know, from as you say, uh, all the way from from Berlin and then stretching through the Indo-Pacific. I'm curious if you could just think out loud about, are we overestimating how enduring some of the shifts we're now seeing in terms of language and defense posture are? Let's assume, and this would be an, this would be a hopeful case, tensions die down very rapidly. Negotiations occur. I don't think this, this is likely, but let's just, for the sake of argument, um, uh, negotiations occur. Uh, th there is some sort of uh, negotiated ceasefire and we see the tensions end sooner than later. Um, do we see an unwinding of some of the language and rhetoric we're seeing coming out uh, across the Indo-Pacific? Or, or do you see these really, this, these are enduring shifts regardless of, of how events play out in Ukraine? Uh, well, it depends. Okay, so let, let's take your assumption, Jude, uh, that, that this, uh, God willing, uh, ends tomorrow, right? You have a full Russian pullout. Uh, I mean, one, we'll, we'll note that this is an implausible suggestion, as you yourself noted. Uh, but if this were to happen relatively quickly, uh, you know, whether or not uh, countries would kind of unwind uh, where they have been going in the Indo-Pacific, I, I think the question really uh, depends on which countries we're talking about. Uh, I think that uh, kind of partners uh, and fence sitters uh, might very well uh, say, OK, that's far away and that didn't happen. But considering the movement that you've already seen in advance of this, uh, by America's closest allies, Japan, uh, Australia, uh, India, not an ally, but kind of movement that we've seen on the quad, on the quad uh, also with AUKUS. Uh, I actually think that this, uh, the timeline of what happens in Ukraine uh, has no effect on what's happening. And in fact, what has already happened in Ukraine, uh, I actually think turbocharges efforts uh, that are underway. You know, Bonnie made a couple of really interesting points about uh, lessons learned. I, I've been thinking about this too, right? It is obviously premature to render judgments about kind of the efficacy of what has happened uh, in Ukraine and in Europe. But I don't think it's premature to begin speculating about what this model of surprising solidarity, surprisingly robust solidarity, actually means in other parts of the world and more specifically in the Indo Pacific. And I actually think that what we've seen is the fuzzy outline, the hazy outline of a template uh, that now needs to be built upon, uh, needs to be sharpened further, and needs to be oriented towards the Indo-Pacific. You know, Bonnie talked about, um, you, again, I, I actually think you're already seeing elements of this, right? So uh, countering uh, Russian moves in disinformation, staying ahead of the intelligence flow. That's very clear application in the Indo-Pacific, particularly when we're talking about, uh, you know, Beijing's use and mobilization of military and paramilitary uh, units. Uh, it's uh, encouraged, it's endemic interference in other countries' uh, domestic affairs and its flagrant uh, violations of international law. I, I think that this is, you know, the spark that might turbocharge U.S. and others on that. I, I would note too the punitive sanctions that we saw. Um, these take a long time to coordinate. And uh, if I were sitting in Canberra, in Tokyo, in Seoul, and elsewhere, I would be getting out my pencil, sharpening them, and beginning to make a list of which ones uh, would bite, which ones kind of get you up the escalation ladder from there. Uh, you can also think that with the cutoff or the potential cutoff of critical materials like energy, like gas uh, that Russia has threatened and actually impacted Europe with, you can bet that there's going to be a turbo charge now to begin to stockpile critical materials. The other two ones that I just note here is that we have seen the West rushing to give defensive uh, weapons to the Ukrainians themselves. We're, you know, we're beginning to talk about what supply lines will they take in there. Well, when we talk about Taiwan, frankly, when we talk about the Philippines or Vietnam, the question is, how much can these efforts be accelerated within those own countries and how much can other countries help them get those weapons 
now. And then the final point I would just make is you've seen the allies kind of rushing to shore up NATO's flank. That's what President Biden talked about in the State of the Union. You've seen multiple countries, Spain, Europe, the Baltics, everyone going in there, right, to make sure that this doesn't spill over. Well, we've been talking about initiatives by the United States to diversify its posture and get more forces into the region for a long time. Strikes me as now would be the time to begin moving on that. And frankly, for Japan uh, and Australia also to begin to accelerate their efforts, Australia into the Northern Territories, Japan across the Southern Islands at this point. Thanks, Ray. Those are great points. And just as I was listening to you give that really good analysis, it is just striking that I think you could find commentaries from just two weeks, no, sorry, a week ago, saying that really Putin and Xi Jinping had won the post-Cold War. And uh, just in the matter of a short week, how um, how wrongheaded those those commentaries seem. And, and, and this is one of those unanticipated um, just remarkable resiliency and cohesion amongst, I think, the United States, Europe, uh, and, and allies across the world that I agree, I think, irrespective, and, and as you say, you know, God willing, we see a, a wind down of the tensions soon. Something very important has just shifted in the international order um, that, that, will, um, that will endure. And one of them, another unanticipated for me, which I think will, will endure beyond uh, uh, certainly beyond the tensions in Ukraine, is thinking about um, China and risk calculations. To, to Bonnie's point, while I agree there should be, Bonnie laid out the lessons um, Xi Jinping should be learning. I think one of the things I now can't um, say in good conscience, which I, which I would have up until, let's say, a week ago, is um, the, the risk calculations which Putin should have been factoring in when thinking about why an invasion did not make sense clearly um, weren't enough to deter him from invading. Uh, so I think um, my normal cool uh, uh, risk calculation for why an invasion does not make any sense for Xi Jinping, I think I now have to pause on that because we have just seen a leader who up until a week ago we thought was a shrewd master strategist playing 3D chess and for who decades had been playing a, a poor hand very, very well, suddenly showed that being isolated uh, after two years of COVID, alone in the tower keep with a very small circle of advisors, with a, um, a set of grievances against the West, um, uh, with a, a deep-seated conspiratorial uh, historical narrative about territory on his periphery, and a, and a view towards a nation state which he believed did not have any right to exist, there are some very, very eerie parallels in, in thinking about China. So I don't think this happens tomorrow. But I do think this we all have to recalibrate our analytical framework here to, you know, in light of, of events that we've just seen. But that being said, I think, you know, I think Bonnie's important set of lessons learned should should be from just even a regime preservation standpoint, should be how Xi Jinping is filtering this. I just have deep concerns about how much of this uh, uh, his ability to filter. And, and Bonnie, I want to come back to that in a minute. But let me now just um um, and we're doing well in time, so I think I've got uh, space to get through a quick lightning round here of questions I have to ask, and then we'll open it up. We've got some really great questions coming in. But Charlie, you had you had quickly referenced the quad. Let me go around the horn and ask um, about impacts on the quad here. Th there's been a bubbling discussion for a while about do we need a an Indo-Pacific NATO. Um, I'm just curious about some of the long-term repercussions here uh, and maybe tying this to uh, um, thinking about China and China's ambitions and potential risk appetite. Um, let me go, Bonnie, Rick, and then back to you, Charlie. How, how do you see this events that are playing out right now reverberating or affecting uh, discussions in the quad in the near term? But really importantly, um, does, does this auger a potential uh, direction change or renewed sense of purpose for the quad, one that we were already seeing building in intensity just over the past couple of years. Uh, I think, I guess, if I was to place myself in Beijing's shoes, Beijing probably should be more concerned that the quad may have more of a military dimension moving forward. Uh, as Rick highlighted, right, one of the major shifts we should see is uh, India recalibrating its position. And Beijing is well aware that in the past, one of the major hurdles with the Quad moving forward, and particularly having more of a military dimension, has been the limits, for example, coming from India's end. 
So as Beijing watches the dynamics, uh, if I was in Beijing, I would be quite concerned with where the Quad could go. Let me just follow up really, really quickly on your point about the um, lessons learned, the comparisons between Ukraine and Taiwan. So I think one major difference that uh, has been, maybe has not been highlighted as uh, well in some of our previous discussion was it was clear to both the Russians and the Chinese. Maybe, maybe, maybe that I'm saying clear now that we're looking back, but I think it was we did message that we are not. When I say we, I, I mean the United States and NATO are not sending forces into Ukraine. That's a, that's not what China is assuming in Taiwan. China is assuming, and all of its planning is assuming that the United States will intervene. So that creates a different calculation on Beijing's end, right? Because from Ukraine's perspective, the main punishment is on the economic political side. But from Taiwan, it will be not only the economic and political punishment, but it, it will also be the direct military intervention. That should have a significant, that should really, if the assessment that Beijing takes from Ukraine is that political economic punishment by itself is already quite significant, you factor in the military intervention, it should be even a more deterrent for how Beijing looks at Taiwan. Yeah, great, great point. Rick, over to you. Well, a couple of things. Um, you know, I, I think that the quads gathering is for a different reason than Russia. And so if you have a you have a summit, you have a program, an event, a, a head of state uh, summit that's expected in just a couple of months. Uh, I, I don't expect this is going to cloud the waters to any dramatic effect. Uh, the quad does sometimes, you know, consider itself sort of this grouping of democracies. But also, I do think that rhetoric, too, is likely to die down over time. If this is the organization that is going to be the counterweight to China, there are so many countries across the Indo-Pacific that are certainly not going to fit into this uh, narrow box of a perfect democracy. So I, I, I do think over time, too, that you're going to see that rhetoric die down because, you know, Bangladesh hasn't had a democratic election and it's one of the most populous countries on Earth. Even Singapore, to some extent, Myanmar, if they ever pull out of the, you know, this uh, this uh, military autocracy. Um, there's a lot of swing states that are on democracy. So I suspect that rhetoric, which, you know, right now could be a little bit painful uh, from India's intransigence on uh, the, the invasion, I think will die down. But the, the main threat, you know, is the disruption in the U.S.-India leg. If uh, U.S.-India relations rupture because of, you know, concerns about India's, uh, you know, lack of a stiffer position or the, the introduction of CATS sanctions, if there's a disrupt in U.S.-India, then, um, you know, that, that I think could be the most dangerous uh, thing for the Quad. So the Quad in itself stands on its own. It's got a different mission, a different orientation. But if the bilateral relationship with the United States uh, does suffer, um, then that could be, you know, what I think would uh, potentially cause some uh, some issues with the Quad. Thanks, Rick. Char Charlie, any any thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I find uh, Rick's comments uh, very compelling, very provocative, very concerning about you know the uh, the um, the cats of sanctions that might come down one and how this affects uh, where India goes on the Quad because uh, that's an unknown. Uh, I, I would just say a couple things about the quad. Uh, so first of all, there's public quad and there's private quad. Uh, public quad is about an affirmative, positive vision for the region uh, that others want to buy into, that is clearly meant to counter uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, and that is meant to lift up the region and help connect it. That's not going to change. Um, private quad is about countering uh, China by the world's largest and most powerful maritime democracies. Uh, that's not gonna change either. The critique that you've seen occasionally popping up of the quad is that all the affirmative uh, messaging, all the positive uh, goodies that are potentially being doled out across Southeast Asia and the Pacific don't do a lot to deter uh, China. They might, may or may not have an effect on Southeast Asia and the Pacific Island states in their orientation if more of them come online but it doesn't do much by way of the deterrence equation. Uh, and so the private conversations don't have a military component publicly, but we've seen hints, right, uh, that there is uh, more to be done on MSI and maritime security uh, work together. Uh, it strikes me that what we have seen over the past week uh, is going to bring even more increased urgency on those conversations in private. It wouldn't surprise me at all if you see all, saw some of these private conversations, particularly on the military strategic dimensions, uh, beginning to become more prominent if there's a leader summit um, in late May between the country's leaders up in Tokyo. Uh, the other thing, though, that I would say, which is interesting, is that um, the United States, Australia, Japan, and India, I bet all in their own ways, are going to hit the gas uh, on what this means for them in the region. The question is, 
Will this be done separately or can these be linked to efforts geographically, also in terms of interoperability? Uh, and you know, the, the last thing I would just say is I think it is uh, the leaders of each of the Quad nations are fully cognizant that this is not one hand clapping, this is action reaction. So Russia has invaded Ukraine. Now Russia and China are watching, as Bonnie has laid out, what the reaction of the West will be, how long it will hold, and if it will get more severe. The bet, I think, from Russia and China previously, and I grouped them together here, is that whatever the Western uh, nations decide, it will be insufficient, it will be unpalatable to their publics, and it will be unsustainable. That's their bet, I think, on how Western cohesion will hold. And I think that the leaders of the Quad nations, which will be taking the lead on this, are going to work their darndest to see if they can prove that wrong. Let me, um, uh, we're at the, we've got about 15 minutes left and we've got um, just really fantastic questions here. Um, so I'm gonna try to group some of these together. So one bucket seems to be about the broader U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy in light of what some are now framing as a two-front competition now that Russia has um, has has made this extraordinarily um, uh, aggressive gambit in Ukraine. So let me sort of throw this out. Um, you know, maybe Bonnie, start with, with you, if you don't mind. Um, how do you think, what are the repercussions of this going to be on uh, uh, Indo-Pacific as a priority for the United States. You've seen this debate. Some are saying we need an Asia, Asia first policy that we really need to be minimizing uh, what some are perceiving as a potential um, distraction from a focus on China. Others, and I think you know, our, our colleague Mike Green has uh, taken the position that you can't, you can't make a clear delineation between the two because what happens in one theater has an important effect uh, on the other. But just as a diagnostic, uh, analysis. What do you think the practical effect of this crisis in Ukraine will be for the America's ability to quote, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time? And then we'd love follow up from anyone else who wants to dive in. I would just add that Charlie has also written and commented on quite a bit on the Indo-Pacific strategy and what implications are after the uh, Ukraine crisis. So I'll I'll try to leave more time for Charlie to to share his thoughts. Uh, but my position is not surprisingly aligned very much with Mike's. Uh, so I don't think, for example, us taking the strong position that we have in Ukraine is in any way distracting from our ability to message in the Pacific region. As as you as we've discussed earlier, right? Uh, many of our allies and partners in the, in the Pacific are watching what we're doing in Ukraine, taking lessons learned on U.S. resolve, U.S. willingness to defend a partner, as well as then looking at how uh, the international community is working together to counter a aggression by Russia. So if you look at whether you're talking about Taiwan or another conflict in the Indo-Pacific, there will be similar expectation that the international community, so not just those in the Pacific, but also Europeans, will be coming together, for example, to the defense of Taiwan or whatever other crisis or conflict we might see in the uh, Indo-Pacific. I, I would also note that um, for, uh, right now, at least, it does not seem like that our uh, uh, it does not seem like that we are at a um, we are much we're strained in terms of our ability to focus on both regions. But as Charlie has noted again and again, we're still seeing this conflict play out. And if it escalates beyond Ukraine, right, to the Baltics or elsewhere, that might require significant more US and NATO military involvement, which could then uh, longer term uh, pose some difficulties in terms of at least DOD's attention on the Indo-Pacific. But right now, I think it's still very much watch and see, and I'm not seeing the, the United States having to choose between Europe versus the Indo-Pacific. Charlie, thoughts? Can we walk and chew gum at the same time? I certainly hope we can. I think the rest of the world hopes we can as well. Um, uh, so, uh, look, uh, I think these calls that the United States uh, uh, should either restrain itself and its military posture or that the United States should only focus on the Indo-Pacific. This past week has shown that neither of those two propositions are tenable in realistic foreign policy. Uh, that That is not how the world works, and that's not how the United States is going to structure its orientation towards the region. Uh, the question is, I think the administration has really acted nimbly in working to corral and harness a lot of Indo-Pacific nations to amplify cohesion 
on what is occurring in Ukraine. Now the question becomes, can they do this in reverse? Uh, as everyone is focused on Ukraine, can they get Indo-Pacific nations working more closely together and eventually pull the Europeans there? I, I think the answer is yes, because we have seen over and over again, Bonnie's already hit this point, that if you kind of pull up your aggregate totals of what the West has uh, versus uh, what China has, it's actually not a competition, but getting that alignment is so challenging to do. So I would say the things that you really need to be looked for here are whether or not resources are more forthcoming than they have been uh, on the good guy side of the equ equation here. And frankly, as these choices become more painful for democratic nations, whether or not we're able to endure a little bit more pain and a little bit less of the good resources that we would otherwise choose for ourselves. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's clear. I mean, first of all, I think the administration has just done a, a, a just an absolutely superb job. Um, and I think especially if we're looking at the, I think a lot of people were expecting maybe in Afghanistan, you know, two two But I think it's it's just remarkable how well they've they've done here, both nimble. Um, I think um, working, uh, put helping other countries be out in the lead, um, um, while at the same time coordinating. Um, the other thing too, and I think it's it, the events of the past week have completely demolished the Asia first argument. And as Bonnie laid out, Beijing is washing events uh, occur right now with great intensity. Um, and we would have made our lives far more difficult in the Indo-Pacific if we had simply turned our back. And here's the other thing. I don't see how you can have an allies first uh, position on China or competition with China as you turn your back on your allies in Europe and say, this is your problem. Oh, but we'd like you to show up in the Indo-Pacific when we need you uh, in, in the coming years. Well, Rick, let me Judah, I think too, I mean, on that point and, and kind of reflecting a bit of what Charlie said, you know, the sort of muscle and, and the things that we need to do in, in the two different theaters are very different, you know, and there's not gonna be a competition in a lot of areas for those resources. It, it feels sometimes to me like grass is always greener. The Europe folks say this attention to Europe or the attention to the Indo-Pacific, you know, we're losing ground. And, and a lot of us that engage in the Indo-Pacific say the same thing. Like, why is there still so much senior level attention on the old fights in Europe? Russia's a declining threat, blah, blah, blah. Uh, of course, you know, really at the end of the day, it's our friends in Latin America and Africa that get the short end of the stick, you know, for the most part in these things, which uh, continue to get ignored as the bigger threats are in other markets. But you think about you know, Russia, if we really want to pinch Russia, it is blocking their ability to control markets through energy exports, which is something China is not necessarily going to be able to dominate. Um, it is a uh, ground warfare um, with a lot of the neighbors there, land power. Um, you know, it is also defense exports to countries like India, where if, you know, the United States can improve our ability to replace as the supplier of choice, then uh, then that reduces Russia's ability to influence some of those players that are in the middle. But with China, you're talking about sea power. You're talking about the ability to dominate critical technologies, the production and send, you know, to, to neighboring countries, regional infrastructure. So the toolkit, for the most part, you know, on the main threats that are presented by Russia and China are also very different. So at least if they were all doing the exact same stuff and both are major energy producers and both were supplying defense tech to a lot of our somewhat friendly nations, then the challenges, I think, would be a lot more stark. You know, you do have some states like inform information warfare where you got to be able to counter for both. But uh but a lot of the big areas and the big grasps they got in other countries, um, you know, there is a little bit of diversification, which I think is going to help us spread out a little bit. Rick, next question is coming right back to you. There's a, a, a large group of questions here. I think probably um, responding to your 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 um, compelling analysis on where India stands and some of the some not compelling of the, enough, I guess, huh? So uh, uh, let, well, let no, I it. think I think you've the questions that are coming in are basically saying, well, well, what can the U.S. And other countries in the West do to um, to alleviate this this tension between, you know, India, Russia, and then India and 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 the United States slash the West. So, are there things the United States can do to plug the gap, uh, whether that's arms sales, you know, parts, supplies? Um, what what's your view on this? Well, you know, I think so far, I mean, the proof points are India be, uh, uh, abstaining from uh, you know fairly meaningless votes at the UN Security Council, right? Not sanctions. They haven't stopped you know, physical moves against Russia. So, so far, fine, give them a pass. I don't think that we should hold India, you know, some higher standard as long as they remain in the game on the other threat where we think India is a big player. If they do, you know, cross that line and they begin blocking specific moves vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia, you know, votes on sanctions, things like that, 
things escalate, you know, considerably. Um, but I think for now, you know, we got to play the long game. We got to understand that ultimately, you know, for India too, this is a stark moment, even if they're not going to start waving their arms and saying, this is the day we break from Russia. You know, you're unlikely to have anything quite so stark. But that, you know, that change from zero buys of U.S. military equipment to 20 billion, which has happened just in the last 15 years, and diversifying to France and Israel and other countries, you know, I'd be really shocked if we don't look back on this day, you know, 10 years from now and say that it didn't trigger a, a much faster acceleration of the shift away. And, and I think we got to be prepared to play the long game. Uh, you know, the, the relationship with India on security means is not about Russia. It never has been as long as they don't block actions. And if you consider a, an empty UN Security Council vote on language that Russia is going to ignore anyways uh, or veto, um, they haven't stopped the move. And, and so I think, you know, give them a pass unless they start actively blocking specific measures that would directly harm Russia and, and, and impinge its ability to conduct this war. Play the long game. Uh, I think it's still a, a pretty good bet, but it's going to take a lot of work, including dodging, obviously, the, the sanctions bullet that's heading directly at us. Questions coming in about um, where China uh, where China goes from here. Um, there seems to be a movement from Beijing now attempting, I think, in, in recognizing that its strategy is completely incoherent. Um, it's now starting to move to position itself as potential peacemaker. We saw this in the Xi Jinping Putin readout of their call last Friday, where uh, Xi Jinping says you should you should negotiate, and Putin says we're willing to negotiate, and then subsequent comments coming out of the MFA and and Wang Yi. So let me you know Bonnie, let me direct this one to you. Um, uh, Beijing's role as potential peacemaker here. Uh, Makes strategic sense. Uh, I very much get it. How credible is is this going to be, and does this augur uh, a more um, a shift in Beijing's overall posture here to try to navigate through the rest of this crisis? Uh, so, I'm not sure how credible it is because Beijing so far has not been willing on the record to lay any blame on Russia at all. Right, even though Beijing is now characterizing the what's happening in Ukraine as a conflict, not no, no longer just a special military operation. We have not seen any um, uh, any political statements blaming Russia for it. All the statements have been uh, equal responsibility in moving this forward and for negotiations. But to date, we haven't seen Beijing at least publicly assign sufficient blame. In terms of uh, uh, functioning as a peacemaker, I think what we would need to see is what is happening on the economic side, because I would. I would guess many folks would see Beijing as not necessarily playing a neutral role if at the same time Beijing is advocating for negotiations, Beijing is still providing economic support for Russia. So Charlie mentioned Beijing's lifting of restrictions on wheat recently. There are now some reports from Bloomberg coming in in terms of at least two major Chinese banks potentially uh, limiting purchases of Russian commodities using, using a dollar denominated uh, transfers, but it's unclear what's happening on the UN side. And even then, it might just only be a short term, uh, temporary uh, decrease uh, in terms of Beijing's efforts on the economic side. So we'll need to watch that. And militarily, we do see some distancing between Beijing and Russia in terms of uh, Beijing being relatively clear in saying that it is not providing any military arms to Russia. And the near term, we'll probably see uh, even more caution on Beijing's end, and probably not very much uh, military to military engagements from both sides. But I, I guess I don't see Beijing really playing a credible neutral third party role as a peacemaker. Um, we just have a couple minutes left. So I want to do something completely unfair to the three of you and ask you to summarize the long term implications of the Russia China relationship for your own region in 25 seconds or or less. But no, honestly, we just got a few minutes left. But this is a, another thread of questions which is coming in is. Um, I think both where does China-Russia relations go go for here? Maybe, Bonnie, you can give some thoughts on that. But then I think also for, for your own region of interest and area of interest, how does a, a potential longer-term Moscow-Beijing relationship um, shift dynamics? You know, Charlie in the Indo-Pacific, India, or Rick in India, uh, and then Bonnie maybe, you know, thinking about um, issues like Taiwan. So let me go, uh, Charlie, Rick, and then we'll end with, with Bonnie. Uh, so two quick 25 second or less uh, comments. Um, uh, so one, uh, the Russia-China relationship uh, depends on what happens over the next uh, weeks, uh, months. Uh, if 
if it is shown to Beijing by the actions that Russia continues to take, that it's not in their interest to embrace Russia as tightly as they have, that will shift things in ways that we haven't seen to this point. Uh, second, um, I think this drives Russia even further into China's camp uh, because they will be even more isolated than they have been. The final point here is just, you had asked Bonnie um, what uh, Beijing's calculus is, but there's a whole nother question here about what Washington's calculations are. And there was some fantastic reporting in the New York Times by Ed Wong that there was an argument made by senior administration officials to bring China in as the peacemaker and they shared intelligence with the Chinese about where the Russians were massing. And then there was further intelligence that the Chinese turned it around and brought it straight to Vladimir Putin. I think the um, the bar for engaging China as a good faith actor just got significantly higher from Washington's perspective. Rick, uh, I think for U.S. India, um, you know, we we may this may be the trigger for a, a big rupture. I, I still think we're going to make it through uh, this uh, potential application of sanctions, um, but uh, the, the the I think the percentages on this uh, worsened considerably. Uh, if we make it past that, then I think it's going to be relatively good things. I think it will cause Delhi to, to start to accelerate the shift away from Russia as a major supplier of military equipment. And also, you know, this, uh, this uh, uh, I think, a real spike in, uh, in hydrocarbon prices that you're seeing globally uh, is also going to double down on India's interest in kind of meeting some of these lofty targets they set on climate change and renewable energy, which, again, is, is really among the top priorities of the Biden administration. So don't discount that. You know, this this could actually uh, accelerate. Uh, I think um, you know one of the one of the tier one perspectives of the uh, Biden administration. Bonnie, final final words. Uh, I agree with Charlie that uh, one dynamic dynamic that we'll likely see is Russia leaning more towards China, but China, I believe, has a little bit more flexibility in how it will respond, and I think that's where it's really important for U.S. policy to make sure that we're not pushing China even more closer to Russia. So, to the extent we can be. I don't know whether the word is more balanced in our thinking about China, Russia, not just lumping them in, in, into one group all the time. That would help uh, pre prevent, at least to some extent, limit further strengthening of the China-Russia axis. Yeah, although I have to say a strength in China-Russia axis is galvanizing some important uh, uh, side effects that that um, I, I wouldn't mind seeing a few more of, to be honest. Um, Thank you. This has just been really an excellent conversation. And I, I think we may want to do this every day for the next six months, given the, <laughs> given the pace of, given the pace of change. Yeah. But honestly, I think we should revisit this because um, as we've seen just how quickly events on the ground are shifting these big, I, I, just extraordinarily important geostrategic shifts uh, across the world right now. I think everyone is aware that this is one of those seismic events that we'll be unpacking uh, for, for years, if not decades to come. And so this is a first draft of history here and, and couldn't have done it with three better analysts and, and colleagues. Thank you everyone for joining us. I ha have to also really thank the CSIS team who puts these events together and, and makes these look like we know what we're doing when in fact there's just a lot of behind the scenes work uh, from our colleagues who help uh, organize this, just do the really fantastic graphics, um, uh, get this out seamlessly. So we're, we, couldn't, we couldn't do this without them. So um, thanks everyone, have a, have a great day um, and, and please stay safe. Goodbye. Great, thanks.